Good afternoon, everyone. If we could sit down, please. Uh, yeah, pick your get your uh, lunch in the back there. But let's uh, want to call everybody to order. So just some quick business, as we always do when we have a big event on campus. Um, if there is any sort of emergency, there's exits where we see an exit sign. Okay, keep keep that in mind to to evacuate the room, and of course go outside. Don't go upstairs. Um, with that said, um, I'd like to call to order this year's opening ceremony of our Peter Scheim Academic Exposition. This is our 28th annual um, Academic Expo. And to commence, um, we will have um, our invocation that will be given by Father uh, Joseph Laracy. Father Laracy is a priest of the Archdiocese of Newark. He's a member of our Seton Hall uh, priest community. He serves as an assistant professor of systematic theology in the Immaculate Conception Seminary, our School of Theology. Father Laracy is also affiliated with the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science, the Department of Catholic Studies, and the University Corps. And he also um, uh, teaches in our University Honors Program. He is further the founding co-PI of the Academy for Nature and Nurture, an interdisciplinary approach to resilience. And he's also the president of our Society of Catholic Scientists, uh, which I get to serve on the board with him. Father Laracy, if you will. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Direct, O Lord, we beseech you all our actions by your holy inspirations and carry them on by your gracious assistance, that every prayer and work of ours may begin always from you and by you be happily ended through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Father Laracy. Um, to provide our traditional welcome um, this year, we have a longtime member of our community, our interim provost, Eric Linquest. Eric, of course, as we know, is a uh, distinguished faculty member in our um, law school, the Seton Hall Law School. He um, teaches in many areas, but as, teach, as Eric likes to remind me all the time, he, he's an expert on contracts, so, just so you're all aware. Eric uh, re received his Bachelor's of Science in Biology, I bet many of you didn't know that, and also a BA in History at Stanford University, and he received his Juris Doctorate from the University of Maryland in 1995. He's been here at the university for going on now a quarter century, um, and he is currently serving as our interim uh, provost. So Eric, if you will, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Jose. I just want to point out for anyone who's out there, um, because I have other family members who've graduated from it as well, that I did not go to the University of Maryland, but the University of Virginia. God forbid anyone associated with the University of Virginia admit to a relationship with the University of Maryland. So I just feel I need to get that record straight. <laughs> Not saying it's not a great educational institution, they're just on the wrong side of the Potomac River. Um, welcome everyone, it's so great to see so many uh, smiling faces here and such a representation of our overall university committee, or community, sorry. Um, and welcome to the week wherein we share, honor, and unite around Seton Hall's academic and scholarly accomplishments. This week is not only an exposition, but a celebration. We celebrate the inquisitive inspiration that turns curiosity into discovery. We celebrate the intellectual drive that seeks knowledge, as well as the qualities of reflection that turn knowledge into wisdom. And we celebrate engagement and collaboration, effort and determination, excitement and innovation. I am overwhelmed by the wide range of work that will be presented 
Our community has gained new knowledge across all of our academic disciplines, the social sciences, theology, the physical sciences, education, and international relations, among scores of other fields. What our students have done highlights the depth of Seton Hall's engagements with the most pressing conversations, challenges, and debates of our time. The benefits for our students are wide ranging. They achieve self-confidence and advance their oral, presentation, and performance skills. In completing these projects and presentations and performances, they have learned to reach a little further beyond their grasp. They have elevated our understanding of the world, and in doing so, they've elevated themselves. To our student presenters, thank you for gracing us with the fruits of your curiosity, talent, and determination. You now know what it feels like to create something entirely new. I hope that you will remember this experience and use it as a springboard to create even more memorable accomplishments, whether in an academic setting or in your careers. To our faculty, I recall my message from faculty convocation, where I called for excellence in everything that we do. With your skill and generosity, you have led our students on academic and artistic adventures. You shared your uh, passion for learning. Your love of knowledge inspired them to learn more about their topics and about themselves. You have shown the excellence that we need. Though students were the primary beneficiaries, I know you also have gained much from these collaborations. Thank you for taking a special interest in our students and inspiring them to, great, to greatness. I'm grateful to Su Lee Chang, Jose Lopez, and everyone on the Peter Schein Committee for their exceptional dedication. I also thank Dean John Bushman and the whole team in our Office of Grant and Research Services for their excellent work in supporting our research efforts over this past year. Today's keynote presentation will be from Dr. Katia Passerini, Interim President of Seton Hall University, who will give us an outlook of the worldwide view of multidisciplinary research. This week is indeed a celebration in which we honor our academic progress and chart a course to even greater heights. Congratulations to everyone who played a role in this remarkable week. Thank you, and God bless all of you. So as we kick off this year's academic exposition, our 28th annual um, iteration of the Academic Expo, um, I, I would like to thank actually for this video that you're about to see uh, um, our digital media and web development uh, team uh, led by uh, Michael Supius, um, Chris and Mike and Corey, all that are in the back here. Um, so enjoy. The Peter Scheim Academic Exposition is the time when we share, honor, and unite around Seton Hall's academic and scholarly accomplishments. Hi, I'm Jose Lopez. I am the co-chair of the Peter Scheim Academic Exposition Organizational Committee. It's not only a week-long exposition, but a time to celebrate the intellectual drive and creative spark of our academic community and the amazing research they've worked so diligently on. The Peter Shang Academic Exposition stands as a testament to collaborative students, faculty, administrators, and staff. During this event, we honor not only the legacy of Matthew Peter Shang, but the best in academic achievement on our campus. I met Matt Petersheim uh, in the early 1990s when he and I were doing a committee assignment together. We were comparing notes on how on the academic campus the athletic programs get more of the spotlight compared to some of the academics that everybody assumed is taking place with high quality. There was a desire to foster a better insight into the relationship between professor and students 
and to see uh, that research that had come from their various partnerships. I'm always so impressed with the amazing range of work we see each and every year at the exposition. Last year, I had the privilege of presenting my research to Petershine Academic Exposition, which opened the door for me to present at the Big East Undergraduate Research Symposium hosted at Madison Square Garden. The benefits for students are wide-ranging. They achieve a greater degree of self-confidence, advance their presentation and performance skills. Being afforded the opportunity to present in a true conference scenario to my peers and mentors alike has been such an amazing experience. In the spirit of the exposition, the Peter Scheim Faculty Research Showcase emerged as a place for faculty and staff to share their research and scholarly work. It's a great opportunity to see what's happening across all of the disciplines on campus. Over the years and through all the presentations, faculty and students alike have elevated themselves through their own hard work and dedication to their field. To me, it represents the best of Seton Hall University and its ability to foster an environment of academic exploration. We as an academic community are blessed with the fruits of their curiosity and their determination to showcase their own research. As we move through another year of academic discovery, let us celebrate the pursuit of knowledge embodied by the Petersheim Academic Exposition. That video was awesome. Awesome, Thank Chris. You. So, for the last three years, uh, we've had the honor of working with the Big East um, Athletic Conference. And um, what was organized, and this is thanks to our, um, the provosts of the Big East, um, so um, Katia, played a very, Katia Passarini played a very important role in this. Um, we've been organizing in collaboration with the Big East. Um, the uh, academic, um, the, the Big East Undergraduate Academic Research Poster Symposium. And what this entitles is all of the 11 schools that make up the Big East send five of their best uh, students or five of their best research projects that um, their students have, undergraduate students have worked on. So for the last three years, um, we have been sending uh, teams of our, of our best, of the best, as I like to call them, students to present their work at the Big East. This year, it happened March 6th, 16th, Saturday, March 16th, which as, has coincided over the last few years with the men's, uh, men's basketball uh, championship game. So early in the morning, too early for me, actually, 8 o'clock <laughs> in the morning, we start this, this uh, research symposium. And we have various judges from all of the uh, other universities that come and they judge. So um, we, this year, we, we thank um, our, our interim provost, Eric Kuhnhart, who was one of our judges. Dr. Chang, uh, Suli Chang, was one of our judges. Our interim president, Katia Passerini, who was once again for a third straight <laughs> year a judge. So thank you, Katia, for, for your commitment. And I also was one of the, uh, the judges this year. We didn't judge our own students. We judged other Big East teams. But this year, we had a wonderful crop of students. And I'd like to call them, if they're, if they're here, to stand up shortly. And, um, and then I, we have certificates for them. And, um, and if you are present here, you'll have actually the wonderful opportunity of taking a picture with, uh, with our provost, Eric Kuhnhart, um, here. So is Mary Elias here? So, so we'll, we'll, so, yep, perfect. And we'll have, B. Shaw will come. So Mary worked with uh, Professor G uh, Goran um, uh, from the chemistry department on her research. Okay, thank you, Mary. Is Sarah here? Sarah Free? No? Okay. Well, S Sarah Free um, presented this year. Her poster is up here, so you can, you can uh, take a view of it. Is Melissa Mar Martha here? Please, Melissa. Thank you. 
Sadia Raza. Is Sadia here? Sadia worked with Professor Apgar. Oh, she's not here. Okay. Is Zachary Silvestri here? Nope. Also not here. Okay. And um, and then we have Jonathan Zhang. Um, I think Jonathan is here. So Jonathan, this year is our first winner at the Big East um, uh, event. He won a silver medal this year. So congratulations, Jonathan. Congratulations. Thank, our, thank you our, to our provost, Eric Lindquist, for um, <laughs> taking pictures with everyone. <laughs> it is now my pleasure to um, introduce my... Um, co-chair of our Peter Scheim Academic Exposition Organization Committee, um, Dr. Suli Chang. Dr. Chang has been a member of our community here as a professor of biological sciences since 1993. She is the uh, director of the Institute for Immunopharmacology, INIP, here at the university. And um, she will introduce our keynote speaker, Suli. Thank you, Jose. Um, good afternoon, as a co-chair. I also want to invite, uh, welcome you to uh, 2024 uh, Peter Shang Expo and then to this uh, very wonderful opening ceremony, right? Uh, it is my greatest honor to introduce our keynote speaker, interim President Cartier Persanini. Uh, as uh, our poll was indicated, her title will be the importance of multidisciplinary research in arts, humanity, and the science in international perspective. Dr. Pasanini is a distinguished knowledge management scholar. She has over 100 publications in peer review and referee journal and proceedings. She earned a doctorate degree in information and decision system from George Washington University and a master's degree in economics from the University of Rome, Tobagata, I hope yeah. I say it right. She also earned a master's degree in business administration from Georgetown University, uh, where she was a Fulbright and Bank of Rome scholar with a very prestigious scholarship. And also, she has a combined bachelor degree and master's degree in political science in, um, from Louis uh, University in Rome. Early in her career, she served as an interim dean and then dean of the Arbor Roma Honor College at the New Jersey Institute of um, Technology, NJIT. She also served at NJIT as a full professor and uh, chair of management information system in the School of Management. Dr. Pasanini came to Seton Hall, you may remember, in 2020, when the pandemic of COVID-19 began to upset the whole world. In the past few years, she actually successfully led us to overcome the COVID-19 challenges by implementing various innovative, refreshing, stimulating strategy to advance academic excellence at Seton Hall. One of these strategies, I have to say again, that it's directly related to academic expedition. Dr. Pasanini and her provost fellow from the other Big East institution came together to initiate, implement the undergraduate post research symposium at the Big East conference. She has advanced our student uh, our expert research beyond SHU and enable our students through their research to share and a network within the Big East uh, community, family. Uh, to prepare for the conference, Dr. Pasaniti worked with the expert committee to train our Big East presenter, prepare their poster, comment on their skill of presentation and their presentation before the event. Can you believe that she spent three hours with them uh, every year? Thanks to her dedication and engagement in this regard, I would say to win. Um, 
we had uh, six students, as you just say that, participate, and then uh, Jonathan win our uh, first time, win our second place. Um, Dr. Pasanini has amazing leadership skills. During her time as interim president for last year, and beginning uh, for three years of uh, provost vice president, she was a vital voice in the development of a uh, harvest our treasure, the university strategic plan. She advanced a focus on teaching and research that strengthened the academic accents um, across the university. Her accomplishment at Seton Hall include not limited the following, uh, supporting the development of a host of a new undergrad and graduate programs, planning and implementing seeds of uh, innovation, which is uh, rebalance administrative and instructional expenses in favor of instruction. Hiring 60 full-time faculty members over the last two years, and then facilitating the growth of fa faculty grant receipt by close to 150% since 2020-2021. We Expo are very grateful that Dr. Fasanini has agreed to give her lecture during the Peter Shang opening today. Please join me to welcome interim President Katia Fasanini. Gosh, I do love to take credit for everything that everyone does. Um, but let's start ready. So thank you and welcome everyone to the Peter Scheim Academic Exposi Exposition 2024. And as you heard from Suli, the title of my talk is The Importance of Multidisciplinary Research in the Arts, Humanities, and Sciences. And I'm going to look at this from an international perspective. I'll come back at the end. So today you will hear my thoughts as a scholar, as an administrator, and as someone who grew up and spent at least half of her life outside of the United States. And then I, in the second part, I will share some of my own work. So let's begin with the overview. Here, you see the School of Athens by Raphael. This is one of Raphael's most famous paintings and one of the most significant frescoes of the Renaissance. And if we could look closer, we would see that the painting is filled with great mathematicians, historians, philosophers, and artists. And at the center of it all, you will see Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And I wanted to start with this painting because it makes a statement about the integration of knowledge. From antiquity, through the Renaissance, leading thinkers were trained in the arts, humanities, and what we now call the STEM disciplines. And the important point is this, they viewed all branches of knowledge as inherently integrated and equally valuable. Let's look at some examples. Archimedes, who was a mathematician, an engineer, an inventor, an astronomer, and a physicist. Zhang Heng, an astronomer, a poet, a philosopher, an artist, a mathematician, and an historian. Alazan, a physicist, ophthalmologist, engineer, philosopher, and theologian. And Michelangelo, who was a painter, a sculptor, and an architect. So these are just small examples, but those are figures from every era and from around the world. So now let's uh, focus perhaps on the most famous, was Leonardo da Vinci. 
a painter, an engineer, a scientist, a sculptor, and an architect. And his life work and his life remain inseparable. Today, more than 500 years after his death, Da Vinci is known for his singular ability to achieve intellectual unity. And this can be best summarized from one of his most famous quotes that goes like, there are principles for the development of a complete mind. And these are study the science of art and study the art of science. And realize that everything connects with everything else. And the prime example of this ethos is the Mona Lisa. The portrait that you see with the bright smile and with the eyes that seem to follow the viewer could not have been painted without Da Vinci's knowledge of human anatomy. And likewise is Vitruvian Man is based on the geometrical view of human proportions that form the basis for architectural design. In Europe, the Renaissance represented the height of a unified approach to knowledge. However, at the beginning of the 17th century, the Enlightenment encouraged a new approach, which is the mastery of specialties through engagement with ever more specific disciplines. And then for 300 years, this approach was really successful, if not accepted by everybody. But then in 1637, you see him in the picture, the Czech visionary, John Amos Comenius, denounced the breaking up of knowledge into separate disciplines. But that there is a still an important point to be made that the emergence of different disciplines was not inherently based on hierarchy. Even then, the arts, the humanities, and the sciences existed as separate fields, but they were related because they all contributed to the development of human knowledge and to a life well lived. This slide shows the various disciplines, how they continue to inform each other in academic scholarships. And many times, tremendous results are achieved by looking at the disciplines together and not just using them to solve problems, but especially when we bring the disciplines together, we're able to solve more complex problems. Another example is Adar Adalobeles, who was best known for crafting the first published computer algorithm in 1843. And she sought to apply computational logic to a range of fields, including music, the arts, and medicine. And because of this, she was the first to examine how society could interact with computers as collaborative tools. By the 20th century, many scholars have grasped the limitations of disciplinary studies in addressing issues of humanity. And some believe that scholarship had grown more and more fragmented, especially in the difference between specialty and subspecialties. And then they put forward the idea that creators of new knowledge had lost the sight of the in, inherent connections between things. And after all, the world does not separate itself into neat categories, but we use categories to explain the complexity of the world. So now, let's fast track the 21st century. In American higher education, it is a little different. Because here, the separation between the arts and the sciences is more acute. And there is a perceived hierarchy between disciplines, which almost influences a zero-sum game in sharing of resources. And this tension actually increases in period of crisis and during challenges. 
particularly since the Great Recession in 2008, or even the COVID-19 crisis of 2020. And as a result, we have seen a lot of investment now being directed to scientific disciplines. But yet, I would argue that this is a false dichotomy because one discipline is not better or more important or valuable than another. And what we need to do is remember that the best research is done at the boundaries between disciplines or when we move from one discipline to another. And today, in our highly complex and inter interconnected world, it's not surprising that the practical value of cross-disciplinary research is actually starting to be recognized by many universities. We cannot understand the COVID pandemic today without the joint perspective of public health, psychology, sociology, art, and political science. And even the emergence of artificial intelligence will not benefit humanity unless we examine it through the lenses of computer science, philosophy, law, church teaching, and visual and the performing art. Now, as Seton and all, we are blessed with a number of scientists here in the room who are advancing the frontier of knowledge through their own disciplinary work. But many are able to bring innovation through collaboration because these researchers are breaking the silence and are poised to innovate. And we ought to continue to innovate while we continue to remain strong in our traditional disciplines. Now, our dream or our goal, hopefully not just mine, but of many in the room, is that we embark on, in more targeted investments in engineering. For all the reasons that I mentioned above, student law will be particularly strong in its investment in engineering. The addition of this high growth field, and I say it again, high growth field, to our academic portfolio will make us a more complete and holistic university. And because we are so strong in the arts, humanities, and the sciences, we will have the capacity to be better at engineering than many of our competing, com competing institutions. Because we will teach humanized engineering that approaches product and service development from a people-first perspective. And that perspective can only come from our students' interactions with the arts, the humanities, and social sciences. Sciences. Seasonal engineering graduates will not just create highly Im imaginative product, they will create products that will reflect a full understanding of the human experience. Take, for example, as you see in this slide, the program at, on human te te uh, technology at UC Santa Cruz, which is actually founded, funded through the National Endowment of the Humanities. So very often I'm asked why do we need to innovate and why, why engineering? And I wanted to share that something that you all have witnessed. We have all witnessed the acceleration of the development of adoption of technology and engineering in the last years. It took 75 years for 100 million people to have a telephone. Only six years for 100 million people to have a calculator. And a mere two months for OpenAI to have 100 million users. So such attention to STEM seems to leave a little room for the arts and the humanities sometimes because of the zero-sum game. But let us look for a second at the success of innovation. We know that roughly two in three startups today end up in failure and the failure increase with innovation, unfortunately. But we also know that the number one reason why a startup fails is not because the product failed to work, 
but because people just didn't value the product. So the point is, had the entrepreneur spent a little bit more studying the society for which the application was intended, as opposed to just studying the technology that they were trying to deploy, well, the outcome would have been better. We also see unintended consequences of using technology and the need to, to distinguish between commercial success and what's at the end the benefit for society. So who is better to guide us through what society wants and needs are than our colleagues in the humanities and the social sciences? That's why we will be successful at the integration of engineering and humanizing engineering. So I'll leave you now with this question to ponder, who better than our colleagues to help us in engineering? And I'm gonna move now to the next part of my presentation. Because at this point, I would have finished my presentation, but then Dr. Chang said, no, no, 20 minutes, it's really too little. <laughs> so I was like, I can't do an essay for more than 20 minutes. But I, then I pondered a question and I said, what does she want me to say? And then I realized, okay, this is the, search, the research expert. She wants me to talk about my research. So there we go. I was a little rusty, so bear with me, because going back to my research has been a little difficult. So let's start first with where I am. I am on the first page of Google Scholar. If you create your own account, uh, we have Fadiv, Finkelstein in education, uh, rising here from the, from the law school, and then that's me, knowledge management, information systems, innovation and entrepreneurship, and those are my citations. Then if you go and click on Google Scholar, you'll get kind of a wave of, uh, at least mine is a wave, I, others will look differently, different, but since 2003, those are dissertations being counted by Google Scholar. 2004 is just, just started, I, I have a hope that it will go up. <laughs> um, then of course, Google Scholar, Scholar Dean Bushman will tell me is not reliable, you know, because the real database there is Scopus. And you have to think that there is, you know, a heuristic about, you know, you take Google Scholar divided by three, those are pretty much the number of citations you will get in Scopus. So, so it's much less than that. But Scopus found uh, 92 of my articles published since, uh, this is the end of my dissertation, and then this is, uh, System professor, publish or perish, you better publish fast. <laughs> so you, you can see the curve here. And then trying to make it to professor, and then starting administrative roles, you see these ups and downs. And, and those are actually perfectly reflected. If you see uh, up, this is the citation count in Scopus. The, you know, there is a delay because, of course, it takes a few years for a paper to get published. But it can kind of mirror each other, and this is the signal here again. This is just because we are needier. It's not that a big drop right there. Then I tried to, to do, but yeah, how do I describe my research, what I do research on, because there is, as a researcher, you need to be able to do that. What do you do research on? So here I'm, I'm sharing my three key areas of research. One is uh, knowledge management and digital innovation. I've been doing that as early as 2004 till today, I still like to study knowledge management, drivers, uh, way to measure it, what it is, how you can use mind maps to represent knowledge and the like. So here is a description of my research in that area. Then another stream from, again, 2004 to 2019, I haven't done any of that recently, um, in technology enhanced learning and collaboration. This has to do with using technology to support learning, uh, more recently, the latest article were about design thinking. And then the last one, still significant for a period of time when I did it, which was 2004 to 2006, was about telecommunication. I look at telecommunication trends in China um, and different countries. I dropped that because my biggest motivator of doing that research was really that I had worked for a few years in management consulting in telecom companies and I was so excited about those new services that we now 
use every day on cell phones, they had to be invented at some point, and we were working on the marketing plan for what they were and they could be in the future. 20 years ago, that looked like sci-fi. Today is right there on, on your fingertips, but I wasn't interested enough, so uh, that stopped. Now, I wanted to share one thing, though. Because I had to put this together, and I haven't written a research statement since when I applied for full professor, I really didn't know, oh my gosh, how do I classify my research? So what did I do? Gen AI, no, it's not chat GPT. That is uh, a slide speak, which is another of those app. And I put my, my 30 pages CV on slide speak and, uh, and I ask, can you tell me, based on my list of publications, what my areas of research, and please divide them by years, and I got these nine areas, and I was like, I can't do that. I need only three. So I said, can you give me only three? That's why you see all these things mixed with each other. But I have to tell you, that is a pretty accurate description of my research being taken only from the title of the articles that I published. So this is very powerful. And it's an invitation for us here in the room to think about how can we use these tools to really enhance and facilitate what we had to do. I didn't have a lot of time to prepare this, so that was a real help to me. At the end, I also asked, can you tell me how, how my CV is? And thank God, it said, that's pretty good. Okay, so <laughs> I was happy about that. So have fun with these tools and, and look at the benefits and disadvantages. And talking about fun and research, I wanted to close this part with a couple of things that I did for fun. One is uh, a book that I published in 2011. I always wanted to publish that. I like technology, especially the support of small businesses. But my rank and tenure committee kept telling me, don't even think about writing a book because it will not count. All you need to do is journal articles. So the only time I could start thinking about a book was after tenure, and then it took three years to get it done, but it finally came out. And this one more recently was fun because business schools are evol evolving tremendously and we need to understand what's the re relevance, not just the rigor, but the re relevance of business schools. So I had colleagues from, Rico is from Switzerland, uh, Ayman is uh, GW via Egypt and Italy, David is Austria, Daphne is in Israel, and Will Young Tang is in Singapore. So it was a lot of fun to work with these colleagues and that's just an edited book. So we have chapters in there and then we curated other chapters. But that's stuff that and now I have the privilege to do for fun. It doesn't matter anymore as when you have to be a professor that you have to show this stream of research or et cetera. No, I just get to pick up the things that are fun for me. And that goes to my last part of the presentation that I said, you know, I have to show that I'm doing research now. So I picked up some examples for you, and hopefully that will get me to the 45 minutes, actually. Uh, and those are three, four different pieces. My mentor, who was the dean at Army in 2003, always told me, you have to have at least three, four, five pieces of research out at every given year. Because if you don't, you're gonna get dry years. So you saw that curve, curve that goes up and down. If you don't have at least four or five, there are going to be years where you don't publish. So I have always tried and struggled to, to have that. Uh, I think I'm back in track with this one. Uh, so I, have, uh, I, I chose some pieces that hopefully give you a sense of things that I'm interested in now. Um, some I will not present. It's two conferences under review. It's ESG and technology but the one in yellow I'll present. So one is this. Now, I don't know if I mentioned, I'm gonna be on vacation from June 17 for a month. <laughs> so um, if you wanna find me, <laughs> no, no crisis to sit on all. If, if you wanna find me, I'll be in Valencia working on some research that actually just started because I was invited to speak about how we do AI in the US and with my colleagues from Milan, we, we said, oh, this is an interesting presentation. Why don't we start thinking about this? And the Aurelio worked on a model of looking at the role of educator in, in creating courses or designing courses and the role of technologies either as tools where you use them to facilitate your work or as agent of co-creation. So Gen AI is seen here as a creature 
like a, a, a human be being. I mean, when you ask questions, she's actually pretty pleasant when she responds. So we call her Chatty, our best friend Chatty, right? Uh, but this is an interesting two by two model where if you look at the role of Gen AI and the role of educator and you think of them as creature or tools, creator and designer, you can start mapping interactive co-creation, adaptive design that uh, maps also the interests of the students, content amplification, so resourceful planning if you look at them as a tool. And so we wanna continue this work looking at the advantages and disadvantages and hopefully uh, now it's only an eight pages conference paper that has been accepted, maybe will become a journal article at some point as I work with my co-authors. So that's one thing I'm interested on now for fun. The second thing, um, here I have a team of uh, co-researchers um, who are based in South Korea. Um, actually, I didn't realize we had a, an agreement here, as you know, with Sogan University. Yeonjin Kim and I go back to 20 years with MIS research, but it happens to be at one of our partner institutions where we're trying to send some of our students, and he works in a business school. We have been looking because he s sits in a commission that selects uh, um, funding for small and medium enterprises at trying to understand uh, how, how digital entrepreneurship affects business innovation. I'm not gonna go through the whole paper. This was presented in January in Hawaii. I always choose my conferences very well. So every January, this is at the Hawaiian Conference of System Sciences. Uh, and now this, this paper was fast tracked for a journal submission. I submitted on March 15. I don't know if it'll be accepted. What we do is we look at uh, how digital entrepreneurship impacts business innovation and whether we have some controlled variables to deal with. Uh, we looked at surveys distributed to various small and medium enterprises in South Korea. 160 of the responses were valid and we did find a statistically significant re relationship between, between digital entrepreneurship as measured by digital orientation and entrepreneurial orientation and on-demand service innovation, so that 42% 40, of the variance in on-demand service innovation is explained by those two variables. The more interesting part is a subset of those 160 surveys. We also have data for the small companies' sales growth annually, so we can approximate a relationship with revenue, and we see that actually, not only those two variables impact on-demand service innovation, but ultimately, they will impact revenue, which is what a small business wants to know. And the other interesting thing that we found is one of the controlled variable, which is the presence of a CIO. If you recall a couple of slides ago, we had those controls, the digital CEO, CEO the uh, digital transformation officer. If you have one of those in your organization, it's more likely that you'll get higher results. Um, hopefully this will be accepted or we'll get a lot of things to review and we'll have a chance to resubmit. And last but not least, this is work that I'm doing now. This is not even a paper yet. I mean, I think it's two quarter of a paper. I'm working with uh, Mary Kate on this with another colleague from Italy and from Cesar Bandera uh, from NJIT. And we're very interested in looking at international exchanges and uh, um, and what it means actually, what type of discipline students come to study or go to study abroad. So uh, maybe it will be a paper of where we identify the journal, but there is still a lot of work to do. If, is there anybody from the library here today? No, okay. I, well, I will virtually uh, do a shout out to Dean Bushman and his team because this paper would not have existed without the support of the library that told us where the data sources were going to be got us the database, even tried to teach us, us data, which I found that impossible. I went back to SPSS because that's easier for me, but eventually one day I'll learn Stata. But our library support in data analysis here at CINO is just beyond phenomenal. So I wanna give a shout out to them. What are we looking at here? We're looking at public diplomacy as um, 
a way of improving relationship across countries. Incidentally, the U.S. spends $750 million a year in international exchanges. And so we start with a definition of public diplomacy, which include cultural diplomacies, diplomacy like opening cultural centers all over the world, um, scientific diplomacy, which is funding research in the sciences at a very large scale. You can't see this picture, but I amplified it here. You know what that is, CERN. This institution in Switzerland would not exist unless government came together and funded this very large infrastructure to do physics research, uh, quantum acceleration, and uh, particle acceleration type of research. You can submit your research paper, and you need to be allowed to do research there. I think we have one student that is going there actually this year. And then finally, international exchanges are a form of public diplomacy. And what we were interested in looking at, going back to the beginning of the talk, multidisciplinarity is, what do students come to study in the United States and where do they go? And this chart shows uh, the number of, in, in blue is the ones, um, it's US students that go abroad, and in red is non-US students that come to study in the US. So of course you see an imbalance in some disciplines. For example, not surprising, we get a lot of students coming and study engineering, math and computer science, other fields of studies and some uh, some other areas as well. But it's not as imbalanced as one would um, think or suppose. So we started wondering is, what is it that pushes a student from abroad to study a certain discipline? So we decided to merge a model, which is Gert of State model of culture. You might have seen countries being classified by masculinity indicator, uncertainty avoidance, individualism, uh, long-term orientation, and indulgence. There are six indicators that Gerd of State identified, and we actually wanted to see, does that make a difference with the discipline that the students choose because the IAE databases give us, gives us the data? So we brought these two data sets together. Unfortunately, of State data is only for 2015, so we kind of had to map 2015, 16, 17, and the two years before, one can argue that culture doesn't change that dramatically in four years, maybe. And what we found is when we looked at the relationship and we didn't assume that it was linear, but it was quadratic, we actually have very good R squares. So we are hopeful that this paper, once it's finished, it will be accepted. We're even more hopeful that it will be accepted because Cesar, our uh, colleague from NJAT is an electrical engineer, so it dumps a formula anywhere on everything that you do. And you know that when you submit a paper with a formula, it is going to get accepted <laughs> sooner or later. So, <laughs> so, but what do we do with this formula? Well, actually, it's very interesting because if those statistical correlation work, then you have a map in which you can start seeing, we actually use those beta, to rank countries across the disciplines. And we looked at that there are certain countries that are more interested in coming to the US to study social sciences as opposed to the, the usual suspects, right? The usual suspects are India, China, South Korea, and Japan. But one of the reasons why they're usual suspects is because they have huge populations. So if you look at the raw data, you always think that all, the, all of India, we have a lot, some students from India here, is coming to study engineering. It's just it's a lot of people. And proportionally, actually, we have students from Morocco, Iran, uh, Africa, West, Arab countries that are very interested in engineering as well. So maybe we can use that formula to start thinking about where do we want to go recruit in certain disciplines that we want to grow. So that's at least is going to be our argument at the end of the paper on the practicality of this research. So with that, I'm going to stop with the last slide, which is instead trying to summarize my 25 years, remember I started in 1999 finishing my dissertation, of publications, things I learned, that I learned that I'd like to share with some of you that might be at the earlier stages of your careers. The first one is a bullet from the professor who taught us the how to write a dissertation, you know, the first three chapters. He came in, stormed me in the first day of class when you still had classes in, uh, uh, together, and he said to, to the doctoral students in the class, he said, don't worry, we're gonna write the first three chapters, and remember, you're not gonna write the great American novel. The best dissertation is the one that is finished. And that's how we got through our 
first three chapters of the dissertation. That happens to articles as well. I got through articles review once five times. It took three and a half years and at the end it got rejected. At some point you need to understand where your article fits, what's the quality of the journal, and just accept that if you, if you did a B paper, that's a B paper. You're not gonna make it an A by doing 15 different reviews. It's a B paper, get it done, and move to the next exciting adventure. The other thing that I learned was uh, pre-tenure, you have to show that you can do this by yourself. So you have to have some solo pieces. You gotta write papers by yourself because before it was your dissertation advisor, now what do you do by yourself? But after tenure, that doesn't matter anymore, honestly. You have already demonstrated you can do. Work with colleagues. That's why I always have a lot of colleagues. And uh, first, it's more fun. Second, there is a principle that some other mentors taught, uh, taught me, is if one of you gets cited, all of you get cited. And so since research at the later level when you want to become a professor is evaluated also by the number of citations as a proxy for impact later, you know, the better your team, uh, the more likely that you're going to get cited. So work together, although you have to remember one other principle that it's very important. After you made it, it doesn't matter your first order, second order, third order. If you're the junior, if you have a junior person in your team, that's gonna be your first order. Maybe they'll do only 20% one time, and then maybe they'll do 50% the other time, but you just have to make sure that after you made it, others make it as well. Contribute equally, never put your name on something that you haven't worked on, make sure you can identify what you've done. I worked at a university when, when we had to submit our publications, we had to say, I've done 20% of this paper or 30% of this paper. And then the fun from r and I was looking at the other side was, did they match, did they, who's lying, right? So just do, just do the work that you have to do and do it equally, but just equally, but, but just put your junior researchers in front of you. Then do research that is relevant and fun. Hopefully it is impactful, but as the you know, American novel, I. I've given up the hope that I will ever get a Nobel Prize. So with that being accepted, do it with people who like to have fun because that will make research a lot of fun. And those people, while you might not be able to win the Nobel Prize and then impact the world, you will at least impact your network of influence. And you work with people that at the end will grow because of you, you'll grow because of them, and then you'll end up with a team that maybe it's willing to jump with, from an airplane, airplane to come and work with you. With that, I thank you for op the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm open to questions for sure. <laughs> My name is Emily. I'm a senior in the Bachelor's of Social Work program. So you said that some of like the works that you've tried to publish have been rejected. How did you deal with that rejection and like find the motivation to keep going? Oh, very poorly. <laughs> 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 but that's when actually having a team is also very important. Okay. Because if it was just by myself, I would just go and say, oh no, this, they didn't understand me and I go. And then you, first of all, you take a week off and then you work with your co-authors. You, there'll always be someone in the team that will say, let's keep going, I'll do this, I'll do this. So from morning to action, you, you will be able to do that, and better if you do it, again, with people that you have fun with. Uh, All right, thank you yeah. so much. You're welcome, yeah. Other questions? I do want to say one thing. Every paper has a home. So it might not be the one you target at first, that's why you always start with an A first, uh, because I mean, you, you, you never go from a C to an A, but vice versa, you can start with an A, get the feedback, modify the paper, and go to the B, 
and hopefully that's where you stay. Sometimes there, are, there is work that it's just sea level work and you just have to accept that as well. Other questions? The questions? Have you ever gotten it wrong with collaboration? <laughs> you thought that that colleague was the one and no. And how did you cope with that? How, how do you navigate the humanness of that situation? I mean, there is an economic concept of free writing and that exists everywhere. Um, I, actually, if you look at my CV and my co-authors, there are co-authors that I published only once. And most likely is because we didn't you know, uh, work very, very well as a, as a team. But then there are people that you will find in every one of my paper, and those are the ones that now we are developing a relationship that if tomorrow I'm dealing with a crisis at CNOL and I can only do 20%, they know that the day after tomorrow I'll do 80%. So that gives you that flexibility and opportunity to do uh, you know, your research. I do wanna say one thing though. Um, my research nowadays as an administrator is maybe uh, two thirds of one day on, and usually it's Sunday, sorry. I have to skip mass for that, right? Because it takes me <laughs> half a day to just get into the mood and then that's 10% of my time. I, that's a choice that I made because I decided to go into administration. And that's a choice where your co-authors also need to know that if they want to publish something in six months, it's not gonna be six months, it's gonna be nine months. For how long did we start this paper on IIE? We started from last, like no, October. And we're still, right now we just have a draft because I couldn't touch the data until you know I, we had um, uh, the Easter break. That's when I started really looking at the data. And that's something you need to have people that are flexible on that with you. When it doesn't work, you kick them out. Isn't that the only thing? One, fool me once, shame on me, right? Shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, yes. Other questions? I'm very happy that I did complain that 20 minutes is not enough. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah. we get to see how an administrator, her life in administration become the, her research, right? That's what you are doing? Yeah. Yeah, and then I actually want to know that how many postdocs do you have? Uh, um, how many, sorry? Postdoctoral fellow do you have? Oh, yeah, so I haven't had a lot of, uh, graduate students actually since uh, unfortunately I left NJIT because I've been at in, in institutions where we, I didn't have an opportunity to engage with doctoral students. But at NJIT I had a joint appointment uh, between the business school and computer science mm -hmm. and I worked with a lot of, of students or graduate students. In fact, some of them are my early co-authors and we're still co-authors since now. That's a big, big uh, thing. It's, it's doubly rewarding, not only because you see them grow, but when they continue to work with you 20 years later, it's because you made a contribution in their lives. Mm -hmm. So it, I probably had with 15 uh, you know, co-authors that were doctoral students or et cetera at any point in time, but not recently just because of of not even being engaged in, uh, in doctoral programs anymore, being mostly on the administrator side, yeah. Well, INIP has some students can work with you. Yeah, okay, that's good, yeah. thank you. Thank okay, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Hello. Yes. Hi. Thanks. Um, 
I have a question about your research from AI. Um, with how fast AI is changing and growing, how are you and your colleagues deciding on what's like concrete information about it and what's something that's susceptible to change? Yeah, it, AI is gonna always change faster than we do, but the reason why I like to do this work and I actually invited Aurelio, let's think through this, is uh, you need to have a framework, right? Once you can identify the different roles that the te technology can play based on the needs of, in this case, we're looking at educators, then with that framework, it doesn't matter how fast the technology changes, it's, it's a guide on how you have to use the technology. And ultimately, our, our question is, is the tool taking over us, so becoming a creature itself, or are we still using it as, as a supplement? I would argue that we are using it as a supplement, right, as a tool, because we know how to use it. I knew how to ask many different questions that actually just shortened the amount of time that I needed to prepare a presentation, but not necessarily changed what I wanted to say. The problem is, you know, we need to be careful on, of not doing that in a context where people don't understand that it's actually creating what we call today hallucination and et cetera. That's why we have to give the framework and, and understanding of the limitations of the technology. And I think, um, you know, the beauty is, is no journal article is gonna be accepted unless it's, it's a, you know, it has a framework that explains something that we don't know already. If it's just a listing on how fast AI is exploding, that makes it very good for a mag magazine article, but ultimately you have to, uh, to define a, a, a model, a framing model. Yeah. Any other questions? Looks like Father Kay. Father <laughs> Kay. <laughs> I know, sorry. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Father Colin Kay, if, for those of you who don't know me, Vice President for Mission. I'm just genuinely interested. I don't mean specifically about your research, but are there, are there, um, forgive me for using the technical term, things you've learned as a scholar, as a researcher, gifts that you've developed, skills um, that you think make you a better leader, a better administrator in higher education today? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, two things I've learned. Um, I literally looked at my research early on and I looked how long it took to get to the a level article, I have A level publications, thank God. It took me a long time, but I did. What I realized is I was not gonna be focused long enough for that article to make it to an A journal all the time. It's depending on the discipline, sometimes economics, it takes years to get into an A journal paper. So I looked at my interests that are very varied and what it took to be really at the top of your field. And I said, I'm not gonna make it to the top of my field because I like, I'm, I probably, uh, I like interdisciplinarity because I think I have attention deficit disorder. I like to swap from, from multiple things. So I get very excited about different things at the same time. So I decided to go from scholarship to more administration because I thought that that's where I could vary it and keep my mind busy rather than one single siloed project for a very long time. The one thing that I learned though, which I think as of today is still the skill on how I approach research and the reason why a lot of colleagues always come and say we want to work with you is um, sometimes they have a paper and they don't know what, it do, what, what they can do with it. And what I learned, which I think has also helped me in, in administration is um, to extrapolate from the pieces what the broader picture is. So I always look at the system interactions among things. That's what I like to do. And I think that's a skill that it's actually very helpful also in administration because if you're looking at the problem that is in front of you, you might be solving that problem, but you might be creating another five uh, you know, uh, along the way. And once I realized that that was my skill, my ability and what I could bring to the team, I became so much more comf comfortable in joining also you know, research projects that others w were doing. And I think that has been you know, transferred also to what I do as, a, you know, as an administrator. Because if you don't think about systems in administration, you're probably not thinking the right way. Other questions? Hi everyone, my name is Stacia Taylor. I know you very well. Um, <laughs> um, so my question is, um, it's more from a, a graduate student perspective who's presenting or 
present her master's project this week. So how did you determine what, because you, with research, there's so much information, right? How did you condense that? How did you determine what best fit for this, you know, what might be a, a short presentation, I guess, with all the information? Well, I don't know that I did a good job here because probably <laughs> covered uh, everything, but I think there are two things that you always have to look at. It's rigor and le relevance. Rigor has to be a conditio sine qua non. You have to have a rigorous data set. You have to have a rigorous methodology. I mean, it's funny, I was joking before about SPSS and Stata that I don't want to learn Stata at this point. But the fact that my, uh, one of our co-authors is using Stata and I'm using SPSS has also enabled us to make sure that we are actually getting to the same conclusion. So you're cross-validating what, what you have in your data set. So I think that's really good. The rigor is a, a very important condition. But ultimately, the, the impact of any research is the relevance. And relevance is measured is, is this important? Who is this going to affect? And I think the way you have to make a decision is, uh, why did I like the one you know, working on that um, you know, business school project? Because I think that business schools are in a big crisis because they're following rigor. They only want the A-level publication, even if that research is only theoretical and equation and doesn't impact anybody. So we really need to change that because nobody in a business applied field is gonna look at that theoretical paper. So the question that I always ask is, how do I make this relevant to my audience? That last paper that you saw about you know, the studies of international flows, ultimately is to help us decide what if you know, we wanted to attract more students in the fine arts? You know, how do we make this an ap applicable contribution? So I think my decision always, and what I would like look at if, uh, if I was you, is how many people does this impact and how? And how do I make it more relevant to more people in the long run? Any further questions? So, so, so I, I do have a question for you <laughs> about the future. The last one. Let's last, say the last one. one. The last so, one. so like you, I, I have a very, um, very positive view on, on what technology can do for humanity. And, and as you were saying, it's been accelerating so quickly. So the cell phone is no longer a phone. It's almost become a, a personal assistant. Um, and as we see kind of that extrapolating forward, we see our, our, such technology effectively becoming a partner, as you've, as you've been doing research on, as, as, uh, that aids you in learning. But it's also something that gets to know you as almost as intimately well, better than I would argue your, your, your mother or your husband or, <laughs> or wife or any, anybody with you. Do, you. do you see a future where, or, or is it happening now and we're just not noticing it, where when we admit a student, we're also admitting their, their AI, their, their co-partner. And do you see a, a future in higher education where um, you ha we have AI professors and, and we even admit potentially AI um, students to, to come learn at, uh, at Seton Hall or any university for that matter? Do you see extrapolating in that direction or, or where does it go? D do, does it become a po do we become post humans and we have post universities after that? So I recently was um, attending a fascinating talk from the University of Rochester in, from an astronomer who is studying digital worlds uh, and is trying to admit uh, to the existence of aliens by looking at the artifacts of technology because if there is the technology, then there are humans. And this goes to the core of your intersection is are we humans or are we digital at some point? So um, I think we can learn from outer space. Is it a possibility? I, I don't know, you remember, was it the matrix where people were attached to a screen and there was a whole digital world? But, the, but they were batteries. <laughs> they were batteries, yeah, that's one of the problems. The, the AI had taken over. Yes, they, uh, and, and I mean, would it be possible? I, I don't see why it wouldn't be possible. Uh, is it a scary future? Absolutely, but uh, what we need to learn is how do we con continue to uh, control it in a certain way. I don't, I, I don't know that we're gonna admit the, you know, the digital other uh, you know, image, but I do think that in education we're gonna continue to use technology to the level where presence becomes 
um, not necessary anymore. Right now, we love that we are all here in this physical location together. We are insisting that people come back because there is this interaction of one to many that you can replicate. Not unless you have, you know, digital holograms that can replicate you right now from where you are to another city, and you can just lo start looking at interactions. Once we achieve that with technology, then maybe we can get all those other soft pieces of the people-to-people -people interactions and cues that now we can do in a two-dimensional you know, screen, um, like in a Zoom call or, or, um, or, or a Microsoft Teams. And I don't think that that's too far away. I think it will be here. Remember, what we are seeing today of Gen AI has been in the making for the last seven years, right? So it's not that we weren't doing it, it's just that we now found the killer app that is making it accessible to everybody. And we have been looking at holograms already for several years. The past two elections, we were looking at projected people that were describing you know, where all the votes were going and et cetera. So I, uh, that's a technology called the Monterey already uses holograms for teaching. And I think when that happens, um, we, will, we will get to a in interim step to being digital self only. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's thank our thank keynote you. speaker, Katia Passerini. Thank you very much. So it's my honor to, um, well, first off, I'd like to thank a few people bef before, <laughs> before uh, we close our opening ceremony. <clears throat> so I would like to thank um, the Office of the Provost, who is a major sponsor of our uh, Peter Scheim Academic Exposition throughout the whole week. Um, so thank you to our interim uh, Provost, Eric Lindquist, uh, for all his support and all his uh, staff and office that they're providing the expo. We'd also like to thank um, Monica Burnett, uh, Dr. Burnett, and Student Services for all of the support um, that they provide to the expo. Um, we'd also like to thank um, the, uh, INIP, the Institute for Immunopharmacology, who sponsors um, some of our catering and different events here. So thank you, Dr. Cheng. And in general, um, we'd like to thank everyone who participates this week. So we have over uh, 40 events that are going on starting today. We had actually our first event this morning at 10 a.m. Um, from the Office of Grants and Research Services for faculty or for any graduate students, anybody who's interested in um, preparing uh, grants and proposals for grants and such. So we have all events throughout the week from every college and school here at the university. So I um, advise you to look on um, shu.edu slash petersheim and the schedule of events that you'll see throughout the week. And I encourage you to either attend in person as you are now, or for the people that are online, attend virtually. We also have a few um, events that are hybrid events and some events that are just purely virtual events. Um, what you will see throughout this entire week is the tremendous amount of knowledge forming, um, training that has happened, seeking, exploring, discovery that is being done by uh, both our students, our faculty, our staff, everybody that makes part of our, our learning community here at Seton Hall University. So I encourage you to uh, attend a few of the events this week. Um, at the end of the week, on Friday at uh, 3 o'clock, we will have um, over in um, the McNulty Amphitheater, we will have the closing ceremony. And in the, if you can attend that, I would also encourage you. That, that particular event, our closing ceremony, is going to celebrate the best uh, presentations, the best research that has been done throughout, that has been uh, displayed and, and uh, shown throughout the week. So I encourage you to go there. You'll also have an opportunity there to see potentially it's, through, it's from that pool that we will select next year's uh, Big East Research Symposium um, a, a team. Um, that will compete for, our, um, uh, for Seton Hall uh, this upcoming uh, in 2025. So thank you everyone for being here with us today. Um, there's plenty of food as um, <laughs> Professor Schoen is indicating to me in the back. Uh, lots of snacks. Um, take some with you um, so that it doesn't get thrown away. And thank you everyone. And this officially opens the Peter Scheim Academic Exposition. Thank you everyone.